meeting is being live streamed, it's preparing. Okay, we are now live on Facebook. So I am going to pass this over to Claire Johnson, the president of uh, Mystery Writers of American NorCal branch. I'm gonna go uh, dark behind the scenes and let's begin today's event. Uh, thank you, Lori, I appreciate the intro. Uh, I'd like to introduce Brian Patrick Avery. He's an award-winning poet and author of more than a dozen books for children. His middle grade story, The Magic Day Mystery, appears in Super Puzzle Tastic Mysteries, an anthology from HarperCollins and the Mystery Writers of America. His Jake Maddox JV series, Off Base and Soccer Suspicions, were released earlier this year by Stone Art Books. Brian is the 2021 recipient, recipient of the SCBWI Work in Progress Award for his chapter book mystery, The Robot in the Library. He is also author of the Freeman Field Photo Photograph, Black Men in Science, and the chapter book series, Mr. Grizzly's Class. Brian serves on the board of directors of NWA NorCal, and we really appreciate his participation. And I'd like to pass this over to you, Brian. Take it away. Okay, great. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And we will go ahead and get started. Um, can everybody see that? Yep. Okay. So today we're going to talk about getting started with your middle grade mystery. Um, and just off the bat, I will tell you um, what we're talking about here. Um, I'm going to talk about some tools and techniques for writing for kids. But a lot of what we'll talk about today is really applicable to any kind of mystery um, or story that you want to write. Um, so you should be able to adapt this really for anything. Um, so what we'll do today, so we're going to create an amateur sleuth for a middle grade mystery. So that's going to be a middle grade kid um, who will set out to solve a mystery. Uh, we're going to identify an obsession for them, and I'll talk a little bit about what that means. And we're going to give them a secret or a condition, um, and those will help drive the mystery and drive their story. Um, then we'll create a, a crime for them to solve. Um, and I'll talk in a little bit about um, age appropriate crimes and, and what we can and can't get away with at the middle grade level. Um, and then lastly, we'll give our sleuth some suspects um, that'll make solving the crime a challenge for our sleuth. Um, and then at the very end, I'll talk about how um, you can take what we do today and then move forward with writing your mystery. And so um, I am somebody who outlines. Um, I'm not a huge outliner. I mean, I've, you know, Dave Baldacki, for example, when he outlines, he has outlines that are sometimes hundreds of pages. So I don't go to that level of detail, uh, but I do outline. Um, and so I'll talk about how I take what we do here today and then turn that into an outline so that I can start writing. Um, if you're a pantser and you don't like to outline, um, this process will work for you as well. Um, and I'll talk about some of the things to think about as you're writing um, so that you can still use what we do today. But whether you're a plotter or a pantser, they should be something that you'll be able to take away from today. Um, so a little bit about me, as Claire said, um, I wrote um, The Magic Day Mystery, which is in uh, the Chris Grabenstein edited um, anthology, Super Puzzle Tastic Mysteries. Um, and then uh, my two uh, mysteries that came out this year are Off Base and Soccer Suspicion. As you can see, one is a baseball themed mystery, the other is a soccer themed mystery. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about Jaden Washington, who's the um, sleuth in Off Base um, and how um, I came about um, writing him. Um, and then probably a little bit also about Gabriella Carter from so um, Soccer Suspicions, um, because I actually used the process that we're going to talk about today to write both of those books. Um, so those of you who know me have probably heard before, you've heard me talk about the Bobsy Twins. That's really where I got my start in mysteries um, as a very young kid. Um, I actually read all of them. Um, and then I read all of the Encyclopedia Browns and all of the Hardy Boys and um, sort of ran out of kid mysteries to write. Um, and that's where I ended up with this book here, um, which is uh, The Burglar Who Loved to Quote Kipling, uh, which was given to me at a church book sale when I was in fourth grade. Um, if you haven't read it, it's not a fourth grade appropriate book, um, but it was for me um, 
my first foray into reading adult books and adult mysteries. Um, and after reading that, I was absolutely hooked. Um, as Claire said, I am an award-winning poet as well. Um, and um, Langston Hughes has always been my favorite poet from the time I was very small. Um, but I, I've always enjoyed poetry. And actually one of the examples we're going to talk about today is my current project, which is actually a mystery in verse. Um, and a lot of how I write poetry is really informed by um, what I've learned from reading Langston Hughes. Um, I also have here um, one of my favorite books. It's Uncle Tom's Children by Richard Wright. Um, if you've never read it, I would recommend getting a copy and reading it. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, it's not an easy read. Um, the subject matter is really, really dark, um, but it's an incredible example of using um, atmosphere and emotion um, in writing. Um, and so that's one of the books that I go back to a lot. I still have the copy that I had when I was younger. Um, it's almost falling apart because I always read through it, read sections and all of that. Um, and then we will talk also about one of my favorite sleuths, Hercule Poirot. Um, I'm a huge Agatha Christie fan as well. And so we'll talk a little bit about those today. But those are really the books that really turned me into the writer that I am today. So let's talk about who we're writing for here. Um, as I said, this is um, today's um, class is kind of focused on middle grade, but you'll be able to adapt this to anything. And so in the middle grade area, um, kids tend to read up. And so when you're writing with a middle grade age protagonist, remember that you're going to be writing for kids who are anywhere from eight to 12 years old. And in many cases, younger than that, um, even. These books tend to go from anywhere from 15,000 to 60,000 words. Um, and so um, something like um, Aida Salazar's The Moon Within is about, I think, 18,000 words. Um, and then you've got some you know, longer works from people like Stuart Gibbs. His Fun Jungle series tends to top out around 50 to 60,000 words. Um, these tend to have slightly longer chapters than chapter books, which um, your readers are transitioning from. Um, and there tend to be a lot of series still, um, whereas with chapter books, almost every chapter book is a part of a series. Um, there are some standalones in the middle grade space, but still a lot of what's in middle grade you'll find are series. And when we talk in a minute about some of my favorite sleuths, um, you'll see that almost all of them are a part of a series. Um, I will talk um, because I know Claire, I think you're working on a young adult. Um, and so in that YA space, um, a lot of what I say today, um, sort of think bigger and maybe a little more dangerous and a little edgier and so forth, um, because in, in the YA space, particularly in terms of subject matter, more or less anything goes, um, but still this process you could use um, to write for YA. So in terms of writing for kids, um, like I said, remember kids read up. And so even if you're writing a 12 year old protagonist, remember that any, you know, somebody anywhere from six, seven and up may be reading your book. Um, and so that informs both your subject matter um, as well as your writing style in terms of the language you use, the word complications, things like that. Um, your main characters should be kids. There are some exceptions to this. Um, they tend to be in older middle grade books that have still kind of hung around for a while, but in general, kids want to read um, at this level. They want to read about other kids um, and live kind of vicariously through them. Um, and because of that, really your main characters should be kids and solve the mystery. Um, there's nothing less satisfying than following along with your sleuth for 200 or 300 pages, and then somebody swoops down from on high and solves the mystery for them. Kids really want to see their peers jump in and solve the mystery. Um, and so to that end, you have to find ways to get adults out of the way. I mean, remember these are still children. Um, and so there are adults, whether it's teachers, parents, guardians, um, and the like, um, you have to find a way to get them out of the way. And as we go through this process, I'll talk about um, how I do that um, and some strategies um, for doing it in a way that's both believable, um, but then also accomplishes the task of helping your main character have agency, um, really driving the decisions that are getting made, taking action, and then responding to the outcomes from those actions. Um, of course, if you get adults out of the way, then you have to figure out a way for them to actually solve the mystery. Um, and, and what that means is you have to think through what your mystery is and why your particular sleuth should solve it. And again, this is something you have to think through in any kind of mystery, not just with kids. 
Um, but in the case of kids, you know, how, exam for example, would your 12 year old solve a mystery of a heist from the Senate Sar Sergeant at Arms office in the US Senate? Um, well, that would be pretty difficult for the average 12 year old. But if your 12 year old is the son of a prominent politician and has been given a summer internship at the US Senate, um, they might have access and exposure to do those kinds of things. And so when we talk about creating a sleuth, that's a part of what we'll talk about is what kinds of things would they be able to solve? What kinds of things do they have access and exposure to that will enal enable them to actually get, um, get clues, get access to information and then be able to solve the mystery. Um, at this age level, fair play is still very, very key. Um, there are, I, I've seen recently a few examples of things like unreliable narrators and things like that, but for the most part, kids want to feel like they had the opportunity to solve the mystery. Uh, whether they could or not um, is, a, is a different debate, um, and but they really want to have that opportunity. They wanna be able to go back and see, oh yeah, I missed that. Or, oh, I didn't realize that's what that meant. Or I didn't connect those two clues. They don't want to get to the end of the book and just sort of be surprised by the answer and realize they really never had an opportunity to solve the mystery themselves. Um, kids also love puzzles. Um, and so if you're somebody who enjoys puzzles, um, finding a way to incorporate that into um, the story um, gives your character something to do. Um, every story needs a little bit of downtime where a character is working or thinking and inserting those puzzles provides that downtime where they're sitting, they're thinking through something, they're struggling with the answer to something. Um, and it also gives your reader an opportunity to struggle alongside them and see if they can figure it out faster than your sleuth, and it keeps them engaged. It's a way to pull the reader into the story. Um, humor still reigns supreme in middle grade. Um, kids love to laugh, um, and, and I think you'll find most of the, the best-selling uh, mystery books um, still have some element of humor in them. Um, and find some way to break the tension and, and all of that. Um, it makes, particularly in really tense situations for kids, it makes them easier reads for them and it helps them kind of keep with it. Um, but they like to laugh, right? And so like when I do school visits, um, even for some of my nonfiction work, uh, we spend a lot of time laughing and things like that because that's really what the kids like to see. And so even when I'm writing nonfiction, I generally insert jokes or different little smart remarks or things like that. And kids really latch onto those. Um, and then lastly, and I try to say this a lot, and in fact, I'll probably say it again before this presentation is over. Um, kids love to see themselves in books. Um, and so you know, find a way to make sure you incorporate the wide diversity that's in our world into the books that you write. Um, there are, you know, obviously there are ways to do it um, in a, a respectful way. Um, and so, I, you know, I trust that you'll do that, but please make room for everybody in your books. All right, so I promised you a list of some of my favorite sleuths. Um, and some of these you'll find, uh, we're actually for MWA NorCal putting together um, a summer reading list for kids. And so some of these are actually from the summer reading list. Um, so Zoe Washington from the desk of uh, Zoe Washington by Janae Marks. Um, it's an excellent book. And we'll talk about um, some of Zoe's secrets and how they help drive the mystery as we get further into the presentation. Um, Myrtle Hardcastle is one of my favorites. Um, as I said, I'm a huge Agatha Christie fan, um, and I really have a soft spot uh, for British mysteries. I'm not sure why. I think it's probably all the time I spend watching PBS. Um, so the Myrtle Hardcastle series, um, one of the books, um, Cold Blood and Myrtle, is actually nominated uh, for this year's Edgar Award for Best Juvenile Mystery, um, and that's by Elizabeth um, Bunce. Teddy Fitzroy, um, so he's one of my favorite sleuths. Um, this is from Stuart Gibbs' Fun Jungle series. Um, and we'll talk about um, his, his love of adventure and frankly shenanigans um, that are generally what lead to him getting involved in some sort of mystery. Um, and then I'll talk a bit about um, one of my sleuths, Sam Gray, who's from The Robot in the Library. Um, and then I wanted to include a couple of adult sleuths here because I know, you know, not all of you may have read all of, you know, a lot of middle grade books. And so we'll have some examples. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about Easy Rollins and some of the issues that he has 
um, you know, an incredible character from Walter Mosley, who um, both in terms of the books published, but also in the timeline in the books, um, spans decades. Um, Bernie Rodenbar, again, I have a soft spot for him. That was the first adult sleuth I was ever introduced to. Um, Hercule Poirot, again, I'm a huge fan just because of, I don't, I, well, I see a lot of me in him, a lot of the OCD, and so I think I can relate to him um, a bit. Um, and then another great one, um, and if, if you watch PBS, um, on Friday nights on PBS, um, they actually have a, a Father Brown TV show um, that's based on the stories by G.K. Chesterton. Um, the TV show is great, um, and there are a lot of wonderful examples in the show of some of what we're going to talk about here in terms of why sleuths investigate and how suspects all seem to have some sort of secret, whether it's directly related to the crime or not. Um, so the first thing for me that I do after kind of coming up with a rough sketch of who my sleuth is, and so usually it's you know, it's 12 year old kid. Um, and I come up with something that, you know, some sort of family structure. Um, and then from there, I pick an obsession. Um, and I know obsession tends to have kind of a negative connotation, but I try to think of it as an obsession, because this is the thing that they want to do, regardless of what else is going on around them. Um, and so that may mean that if if life is rough, I retreat into this, um, or no matter what, if I'm, if I'm happy, if I'm sad, if I'm busy, if I'm not, this is the thing I turn to. Um, and this is the thing that readers later on will identify with about your sleuth in terms of their interests away from the mystery. Um, so in um, From the Desk of Zoe Washington, Zoe Washington loves to bake so much so that um, her parents actually get her um, a temporary job working in a, a bakery so that she can practice baking because she wants to enter a kid baking contest. Um, Teddy Fitzroy, as I said, loves adventure. Um, I think he might, he might love shenanigans a little more than adventure. Um, and like I said, that he finds his way into trouble a lot, um, but it makes him an interesting character. Um, Jaden Washington from my book Off Base um, loves baseball. Um, he's an incredible baseball player, so much so, in fact, that he's actually about to break his school's stolen base record uh, when the mystery kicks off. Um, Father Brown loves being a priest. He loves tending to his flock. Um, and then General Gray, and we'll spend a lot of time talking about General Gray in a minute, um, but he loves guitars and loves playing the guitar. Um, and so for all of these, through the course of their books, whenever, whenever things get tough, these are the things that they retreat into. Um, and this obsession really grounds your sleuth because um, one of the things that I found I used to do very early on when I wrote is it was all about the mystery from beginning to end. And it was like there was no life for my sleuth beyond solving this mystery. Um, and so this gives them something to do outside of solving the mystery. Um, it gives some, them something that readers can relate to. Uh, whether it's, oh, hey, I love to bake too, or, wow, that's really interesting. You know, she loves to bake as much as I love to draw. Um, but it, it finds some way to, to really bind your reader and your sleuth together. Um, and then lastly, it also helps um, in the case of if you're writing some sort of, if you're writing a series um, or anything like that, it gives um, your sleuth something that carries from book to book and that your readers can anticipate and expect as they go from book to book. Um, and so in every Fun Junkle Avenger, the very first sentence of each one is Teddy Fitzroy involved in some sort of shenanigan with his best friend. Um, and you know, when you open the book, that first sentence is him doing something, whether it's you know chasing some guy who's slapping zebras, which was in one book, um, you know any of those kinds of things, you know what to expect. Um, you know, in every episode of Father Brown or in every one of the short stories, he's going to be tending to his flock and finding ways to help serve um, the, the citizens and the people in his parish. And so it really helps kind of ground them. Once you're armed with an obsession, then you need a secret or a condition. Um, and so secrets are pretty self-explanatory. A secret, obviously, is something you don't want somebody to know. Um, in terms of conditions, um, this isn't like, oh, I've got an itchy rash kind of condition. This is, um, you know, this is the situation I find myself in. So in terms of secrets, um, in From the Desk of Zoe Washington, 
Zoe Washington's uh, father is in prison um, and she lives with her mother and her stepfather. Um, her father is in prison for murder and her mother wants Zoe to have nothing to do with him. Zoe's secret is that she's secretly been corresponding with her father while he's in prison. Um, Bernie Rodenbar is a burglar. Now that's probably one of the worst kept secrets in New York City, but in each book, the fact that he's a burglar means he's done something um, and he's trying to keep whatever that is secret because that is what's tying him to the crime. Um, and so, you know, he, for example, in The Burglar Who Loved to Quote Kipling, he steals a book, takes it to, um, takes the book to his client who he's stolen it for and finds them dead. Um, and so now he's trying to hide the fact that he's the one who stole the book. Um, in uh, the Myrtle Hardcastle Mysteries um, and in Fun Junkle, um, both Myrtle and Teddy are hiding from their parents and the police and all that, that they're actually investigating a crime. Um, and so that creates a different set of challenges for them. Um, but yeah, Myrtle is every few chapters promising her father, she won't, she won't investigate anymore. I won't investigate anymore, but she keeps investigating. Um, so in terms of conditions, so Easy Rollins is a black man in racially charged Los Angeles in the early 20th century. Um, and so a lot of the decisions he makes, um, a lot of the cases he takes on are driven by the fact that he feels like he's the only one who can help because the police aren't going to help and in many cases may be a hindrance. Um, Poirot is obsessed with having things in their proper place. Um, and in fact, he often laments that the only reason he solves crimes is because he can't tolerate the, the injustice and the incongruity of crime. And so it compels him to work to solve these mysteries. Um, in the case of Father Brown, he's a priest. Um, he's pledged to protect and serve his flock. Um, and so he, he typically jumps in and does whatever is necessary in order to help serve those that are in his parish and in, the city, and in his town at large as well. Um, so why do these secrets and conditions matter? Um, so your sleuth's secret or condition, this is what compels them to solve the mystery. Um, in, in nearly every case in these mysteries, there's an opportunity for your sleuth to turn to their parents in the case of middle grade mysteries or turn to the police or turn to a teacher and say, hey, something's wrong here. We need, you know, we need to do something about this. Um, and this secret or this condition is generally what prevents them from doing it, which is what gives your sleuth the reason to investigate and gives your book a way to carry on. Because you could very easily in chapter one or two have your sleuth say, well, this is a job for the police and then move on. And you don't have much of a book there. And so if you focus on your secret or your condition um, and then why that helps drive them and compel them to solving the mystery, um, that will help push your story forward as you go through the planning process. So a couple of examples. So Zoe Washington discovers as she's writing to her father in prison that she's not sure he's guilty. Um, and she wants to investigate and she wants somebody to look at this and figure out, you know, if he's really guilty and, and if so, if he's not, then who did this and how does she get her father out of prison? Um, Ordinarily, that's something you'd go to a parent and say, look, I don't think this is right. I think we need to do something, but she can't because she knows her mother wouldn't approve. Um, and so she sets out then with her friends to try to investigate and to figure out if there's some way, whether she can figure out whether or not he's guilty or not. And if she's, if he's not guilty, if she can get him out of prison. Um, as I said before, you know, Bernie Rodenbar has to hide what he's done. Um, because you know that in itself will get land him in jail. And so he's got to investigate these murders that happen around him because he can't really go to the police. Now, in most of his mysteries, the police eventually come to him. Um, and so then he has to actively hide what he's doing, um, both in terms of his activities and as in terms of his investigating. Um, Poirot, as I said, is compelled to solve the mystery so that he can set things right and have some sort of congruency in his life. Um, and until he does that, um, he can't rest. Um, and then in the case of off base, um, Jaden Washington gets kicked off of the team um, because he's been accused of stealing the um, answer key for a test and cheating. Um, and so he's kicked off of the baseball team. Um, he doesn't want anybody to know, most of all his parents, 
Um, and so he sets out and he enlists the help of a reporter from the school paper um, to try to track down who actually stole the test and who framed him. Um, but he does that on his own because he doesn't want to go to his parents um, and, and have them find out he's been kicked off the team. That's great. That's great. So, um, all right. So I um, thought we'd do a couple of activities today and give you a chance to kind of do some of these. So what I'll do is there aren't many of us, so we won't take too long, but maybe we'll take just a couple of minutes. Um, just jot down a brief description of your sleuth, um, some thoughts on what their obsession is, and then their secret or condition, and how that might compel them to solve the mystery. Um, and then if you're comfortable, we can maybe share a couple if we want to do that. So we'll give you a two minutes here. Okay, about 30 more seconds. Okay. All right, so that's about two minutes. Um, would anybody like to share theirs? If not, I can share one I've done. Oh, I'll share. Okay. Okay, so I have a 14-year-old girl, 14-year-old girl, she lives with her grandmother. She wants to live with her mother, but she doesn't want to hurt her grandmother's feelings by demanding that she return to her mother, even though her mother's uh, lifestyle is questionable. Uh, she reads books she shouldn't. She's reading books. She's reading adult books that she shouldn't read. And she discovers letters in these books that hint that her grandmother might not really be her grandmother. That's nice. That's a cool secret. I like yeah. that. Very yeah. Good. So, yeah. So she's, she's, you know, she's reading a bookshelf that she's been told is off limits. Ah. Uh, because that's exactly what I did as a 14 year old girl. Um, so, and so then she finds things that she thinks will liberate her from her grandmother, but um, maybe, maybe not. So that's that my idea. That's very interesting. Yeah, that's my idea. Cool. Thanks so much for sharing. Yeah. Um, all right. So just real quick here, I'll share. Um, so the project I'm working on right now, like I said, is a, a mystery in verse. Um, and the main character is Gentle Gray, who's a budding blues guitarist. Um, his mother is actually chief of police in their city. Um, and his father's a photojournalist. Um, I tend to give my characters, um, parents, jobs that keep them busy. Um, it's one of the easier ways to kind of keep them out of the way. Um, and, and then I usually give them a sibling or some other friend um, so that they're not by themselves a lot, but they're unsupervised a lot. Um, and this is the case in, in this particular instance. Um, his obsession, um, General is obsessed with guitars um, and electric guitars um, in general, or in, uh, specifically. Um, and so as a result, he can tell you pretty much anything about any guitar made after the you know, 1950s introduction of the Fender Telecaster. Um, which comes in handy in this particular mystery because it allows him to spot the fact that 
a guitar that's supposedly a 1958 Stratocaster is actually a fake. Um, his secret is that he's sick. Um, for months, he's had headaches and dizziness and um, been nauseous. He's having trouble holding his guitar pick. Um, and he's done a lot of internet research. Um, and based on his internet research, he's pretty certain he has a brain tumor. Um, but he doesn't want to tell anybody um, because he has one big goal. And that goal is he wants to go to this Chicago Blues Festival. Um, and if he's sick, he's pretty sure they're not going to let him go. Um, but he also knows he needs some money to go. Um, and so when he discovers that this guitar is a fake, um, Chandler Andrews, who owns the guitar, offers a huge reward if anybody can find it. That compels him to solve the mystery so that he can get to the Chicago Blues Festival and then hopefully at some point in the future get treatment for his tumor. <laughs> I, want, I, want, I wanted to ask you, Brian, about yeah. technology because you're talking about uh, Google, right? He's Googling that he's sick. Yep. How much, how much technology, technology do you think you should include in these books? Because it's part of their lives, even if it wasn't part of my life as a 14 year old girl. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So I think if you're writing a modern day mystery, um, particularly after the last two and a half years. Uh, where, you know, like my daughter, um, so my daughter's a junior in high school now, she spent um, most of her freshman year, all of her sophomore year um, on um, Google Classroom, and sitting in front of a Chromebook and all of that. Um, and so I, I've been fascinated. I mean, there are a lot of issues with that, right? I mean, that's too much time all day, every day to spend staring into a computer. I work for a living and don't spend as much time staring at a computer as they do in class. But it also taught her a lot of really great skills. And so like she's been looking at what kinds of careers she wants. And so she sits down and she's talking to me about, well, you know, people in this field, they make about this much per year and people in this field make about this much. And I'm like, how do you know that? Well, I went out and I did this research and I found this site that does this. And so a lot of these kids have this exposure now, even when, even if they didn't before. Wow. Um, and so I think, I think in, in many respects, it would feel like it was missing if we wrote books that didn't have this technology in them. Yeah, yeah. So, um, all right, so, so that's my sleuth. So um, I love this line. It's in one of the first books about writing mysteries I ever bought, The Weekend Novelist Writes a Mystery. I still have it and I still refer to it. Um, and in it, it's, um, if you're not familiar with it, The Weekend Novelist series um, helps you write a book over the course of 52 weeks. Um, and it's really, it's basically two days of work um, per week, so hence the weekend. Um, and it gives you step-by-step -step directions on what to write and when to write and all of that. Um, it's actually a really interesting book. It's a little too structured for me. Like I said, I like to outline, but I'm not that big an outliner, um, but it has a lot of really good information, including this sentence. Um, so it says the sleuth enters the story because the killer, unseen by both sleuth and reader has already been there. Um, and I just, I always, you know, because I don't write a lot of books that have death in them, um, I generally um, substitute culprit for killer. But um, I think the, the sentiment is really important, right? Your sleuth has work to do because somebody else has done something. Um, and because of that something, there's, there's now a mystery for your sleuth to solve. Um, and so what I do generally after I have a sleuth that I want to write about is I think about, okay, well, what's an appropriate crime for them? Um, and so generally what you see like in middle grade, you'll see a lot of theft or sabotage or kidnapping. Um, you don't see murder that often, um, though I will say um, I talked about um, Myrtle Hardcastle. So in the Myrtle Hardcastle books, um, so even though it's a Victorian era um, mystery, there's a lot of death. Now, there, it's still sort of cozy mystery. So the violence itself, for the most part, takes place um, off screen. But um, I think in Cold-Blooded Myrtle, I think there are three murders, if I remember correctly. Um, and then, you know, so, so people are doing it. It just know it's a lot harder to sell into the middle grade space. If you're writing YA, um, you know, murder is is pretty much the rigor there but um primarily you're looking like i said at theft sabotage kidnapping but there's a lot of space in there you know what's what's stolen what's being sabotaged those kinds of things and then think about where your crime scene is so 
Um, you know, in the example I was giving before, if there's a heist in the Senate Sergeant at Arms office, right? How does your how does your sleuth connect to that and the crime scene? So how do you find a way for them to get exposed to it, to learn about the fact that there's been a crime in the first place, but then get enough exposure to it to be able to investigate and enough exposure to the people who might be involved in order to be able to investigate? Um, and so those are the things that I think about as I start kind of thinking through you know, well, what's this crime? And at this point, I have sort of a really high level thought about it. Um, and so in the case of um, the Guitar Thief Blues, I had, you know, the crime was a theft of a guitar. The crime scene was the house of this local billionaire who'd spent $2 million on this really famous guitar. Um, and the sleuth connected to that because the billionaire wanted the chief of police to come and see all of the things he had in his collection um, and give him advice on the best ways to make sure that his house was secure to protect them and all of that. Um, and as a result, she asked, since Jendel loved guitars, if she could bring her son, because he'd be really excited to see the guitar. And that's how he was really connected to the crime and the crime scene. Um, so we'll do a quick activity, maybe just one minute. Think about what your crime is. Um, how your sleuth finds out about it, and then what's their initial reaction? So what's the first thing they do when they find out about the crime? Um, and then we'll come back together and talk real quick about that. So we'll give you one minute. about 15 more seconds. Okay. Okay. Um, so real quick, before we talk about this, um, I did, I saw Daisy had a question about a dog napping. Um, and whether that would violate the rule about um, not harming animals. Um, and that's a great question. So I, there are a lot of animal um, kidnappings and animal heists, um, particularly in the middle grade space. And so I think you can get away with it. What I've observed is um, they're typically off screen. So you don't see the animal being grabbed or anything like that. It's just the animal has disappeared. And people have to find, you know, where, you know, where the animal is, who took the animal, um, those kinds of things. Um, I don't, I'm trying to think of whether I've seen something where we've actually seen an animal being taken. Um, and I can't think of something. So if anybody else has read one that they can think of, but I, I think that would be okay. Like I said, you see a lot of it. Um, Stuart Gibbs Fun Jungle series, because it's, a, you know, it's basically a massive zoo and amusement park. Um, most of what goes on is something that's gone wrong with an animal of some sort. Um, and so that's, if that, that's something you're interested in doing, I would check out those books because I think he does it really well. And in a way where you never really think like, wow, are these animals in danger? Um, and the only exception to that was, um, was it, I think it's called Lion Around, um, it is about a mountain lion. And um, one of the guys is trying to hunt it and kill it, but it's pretty clear early on that the, the mountain lion has them outfoxed. Um, and so you never really worry like if <laughs> that the mountain lion's going to get hurt. Um, but so I think something like that would be okay. Um, all right, so once I have a high level view of the crime itself, um, then what I like to do is I go through a process. So I, I work in technology in my day job. Um, and so whenever we have an incident of some sort, um, we do a root cause analysis to figure out what the actual problem was. And then is there something we need to do to make sure that it doesn't happen again? The method we use for that is called the five whys method. 
Um, it's generally, you generally use more than five whys, but um, the idea is you state what happened and then you ask why until you get to a point where you can no longer ask why. And so basically when you get to that point, you've gotten all the way down to the root cause. Um, so in the case of the Guitar Thief Blues, um, Delphi Roberts stole Blind Bobby Lewis's guitar from Chandler Andrews. That's what happened. So why did it happen? Well, Delphi thinks it's wrong that Chandler owns it. Why does he think it's wrong? Well, it's a symbol of how Bobby and his family, because Bobby, it turns out, is um, well, you know, no longer with us, but his family is still around, um, because it's a symbol of how Bobby and his family was cheated by the record label. Well, why were they cheated by the record label? The president of the record label refused to pay Bobby what he should have, uh, which was actually a very common thing back in the 50s and 60s and even the 70s in the music industry. Um, and then he stole Bobby's guitar um, and ultimately Bobby's family was left destitute while the president of the record label went on to become a billionaire. Um, and then you keep going through the whys um, and then ultimately it comes down to Delphi Roberts is actually the grandson of blind Bobby Lewis and he has stolen the guitar to get the money back for his family. Um, and so I go through that process um, and I do that because, and I've shared this before. Um, so this is actually a, well, two pages from my notebook um, that I'm currently working out of for the Guitar Thief Blues. Um, early on in every notebook, I always write longhand and early on in every notebook, there's a page um, and you can kind of see it up here at the top where I just write what happened. Um, and generally I will write for a while, um, you know, a page or two or sometimes three, um, just about what led up to the crime and then what happened once the sleuth got involved. Um, and so in this case, and it's hard to read um, because I have illegible writing, but this says in 1958, Blind Bobby Lewis buys a 1958 Fender Stratocaster. Um, he records a bunch of songs with it. He's nicknamed it Jackie. Um, and then it gets stolen. Um, and then, you know, that's 1962. And then in the modern day, and then we go through these things where this is all stuff that Delphi has done. I haven't gotten yet to the point where Gentle enters the story until we get over here to page two. Um, and what this helps me do is it helps me create the world that this mystery is involved in. Um, and, and then it gives me a place to deposit my sleuth. Um, and so that was always one of the things I struggled with early on in writing was it always felt like the sleuth was the story and sort of carried the story world around with him. But in reality, the sleuth is entering the story world um, and it already exists because of all of these other things that have gone on. Um, and so I try to document all of these things. And then here towards the end, we start to see the interaction between gentle and the thief. Um, and, and how all of that starts to play out. But this gives me a, a good view of, here's how my story started. Here's why my villain or my pro, uh, antagonist is doing what they're doing. And then when they start to interact with the sleuth, these are the actions they're taking. And so then I can pull things out of here and deposit in the story as clues and different things like that. So for example, um, one of these lines in here talks about, um, there's been money stolen from Chandler Andrews um, and nobody really knows why. Well, it turns out the money was stolen to pay for a fake guitar so that it could be swapped out with the original. Um, and so going through this process helps give me some of those ideas and, and helps me through that. Um, so another quick activity is, um, and given our time, let's see what time is it here? Yeah, um, we won't do this today, but sit down and, and create your own what happened sheet. Um, and just, you know, what are the steps that led up to the crime? What are, what are all the things? So like in, in Claire's example, for example, where did these letters come from? Who wrote them? Why were they hidden in these books? Those kinds of things. Um, and then at some point, your sleuth will go in, take books off of the bookshelf she's not supposed to, and then start reading those and find those. But a lot will happen before that process. Um, and and so this is a way to kind of capture some of those and give yourself an idea of, hey, here's why all of this exists and then what it will mean once my sleuth finally discovers it. Um, and then I put a bonus activity in here. So I do this from time to time um, just for fun. Sometimes I write it down. Sometimes I just walk around and talk about it um, in my head. But um, grab a book that you've read 
and, and that you know reasonably well. Um, and then think about what the crime is and then create your own what happened sheet. And sort of describe, you know, so here are the things that led up to the crime. And then here's where the sleuth came into the story and what happened. Um, and then what I do is I do it again and I take that crime and then I create a totally different set of things. Um, and it's a great way for me to brainstorm. Um, and so instead of using what's actually in the book, just make up, a, well, here's what could have happened. And then and think through, okay, well, so if that happens, how is the story different? Um, and that may be a way to either come up with ideas or just to, if you're kind of stuck in your own story, to just sort of get your juices flowing, thinking about something else um, and, and practicing these techniques with something else that's not directly related to your story. And then you can come back to your story fresh and maybe with some new ideas. So after I have my sleuth and a crime and an idea of what happened, um, then I look at, okay, well, who, who's gonna make this difficult, right? If there's a single person who could have done this and it's obvious, that's really not much of a mystery. Um, and so I need suspects. Um, and so from my perspective, what's always worked for me is giving my suspects two things. One obviously is a connection to the crime. Um, if they were nowhere around and completely unaware that anything was going on, um, that doesn't make for much of a suspect. Um, and the second thing is, and we're back to secrets again, is a secret they want or they need to protect. Um, so here I'll reference another PBS TV show, another British mystery. Um, this one's a modern day British mystery though. Um, so there's a great show on PBS called Unforgotten. Um, you can also watch it. I think it's, um, you can stream it on BritBox if you have that. Um, but I love it because um, it's the premise of every season is they discover some um, body someplace um, that's been there for a really long time. And so they usually have to go back two or three decades um, to interview suspects and to figure out really what happened in the case of this crime. And as they meet these suspects, it turns out they all have pretty serious secrets that they want to keep hidden. And so it's difficult to tell based on their behavior, is their secret that they're the killer or is their secret something else? And then very slowly through the course of, this, of each season, we tease out, well, you know, oh, this is this person's secret. This is this person's secret. This is this person's secret. As they narrow down the list of suspects. And then finally, in the last episode, they usually have like two people left with of the big secret. And then they figure out who the guilty party is from there. Um, but when they have a secret, they, they have to protect. Um, it changes how they behave, right? They either don't answer questions um, or they talk too much about other stuff that's not relevant to try to talk their way around having to actually address the secret. Um, but whatever it is, that secret will help make them a good suspect for your sleuth um, and a challenging suspect because your, your sleuth will have to figure out is their behavior because they're involved in this crime or are they trying to protect themselves from something else? Um, so in Guitar Thief Blues, um, I've got four really key suspects. So one is Chandler Andrews, um, who is supposedly a billionaire um, and, and actually is, um, but a lot of his money doesn't come from where he says it does. Um, and so he's involved in a lot of things that are um, pretty sketchy. Um, and so when questions arise about his finances, he's not really all that willing to answer them because of his concerns about how, how it might make him look and what impact it might have if somebody digs too deep into his finances. Um, Harold Willis is um, the caretaker for the property. Um, he's absolutely broke. Um, in fact, sort of beyond broke. He's in crippling debt. Um, more importantly, though, he's pretending to be Catherine Willis's brother. Um, and he's doing that because Catherine Willis is not Catherine Willis. Um, Catherine Willis's secret is that she's actually Janice Street. She's a career con artist. Um, and she basically um, conned Harold out of everything he owned um, in an effort to blackmail him into getting her a job at Chandler's estate because she wanted access to Chandler so that she could potentially get access to Chandler's money. Um, Valencia de la Garza is head of security for Chandler um, Andrews. Um, but it turns out she's not actually a former police sergeant, which is what she claimed when she applied for the job. Um, and as a result, she is also trying to keep that secret. Um, and it, it affects how she behaves when the guitar goes missing and when people start to raise questions about how good a security chief she really is. 
Um, so what we'll do here, we have a few minutes, um, is I'll give you all a couple of minutes and maybe list out a couple of suspects or three or four, um, and then what secret they want to keep. Um, and then generally when I do that, then the last thing I do is I decide, well, which one of these suspects is going to look most guilty to my sleuth? Um, and, and that's generally the person where for me around the midpoint of the book, I have either the sleuth or the police, if the police are also investigating, will decide that that suspect is the guilty party. Um, and, and then at the midpoint sort of discover, well, that's not true. It turns the mystery on its head and the sleuth then has to go back and regroup. So um, take two minutes and we'll do that. And then we'll come back together and maybe share a couple. about 45 more seconds. Okay, anybody uh, want to share a couple of suspects? Oh, Claire, I think you're on mute. Okay, there we are. So I have mine. Um, so one is a former husband, not the sleuth's father, who is writing threatening letters. The second is a priest who has heard the grandmother's confession and is blackmailing her. And third, <laughs> The mother becomes a suspect in a baby abduction. So who is the sleuths? The issue of the sleuths parentage gets even broader. Wow. So I like are, that. I thought, is that too dark? I mean, that sounds really dark to me. Well, you're writing a YA, right? Yeah. yeah. I, don't think, I, don't, I don't think it is. So I, um, okay. I, so last year I was on the um, YA Edgar's committee. Oh, so I uh -huh. got to read um, over 100 YA mysteries. Uh, oh. last year and i will it's tell you task. yeah um, but i will tell you i mean that's pretty much in line with what i spent last year reading so i think that's great would it be better if i upped her maybe to 15 um you know just kind of reading stuff that's um yeah um maybe something maybe something 15, that might 16. you know something that might um you know where where the issue of of parenting is becoming really important because she wants to you know, she thinks her mother's going to be her salvation from a really strict mm -hmm. household. And it turns out that, you know, she's, I, I guess in the end, what I want her to feel is that she has no place to go. Yeah. That's what, that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. And so 14 is probably okay. Um, okay. Because you also have to balance it between, you know, the older you get in YA, the less some of that stuff matters, right? The closer right. you get to 18. Okay. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. 14 is probably a I would think 14 is probably good. And I read a lot of the YA I read last year were like 14, 15 year olds. Okay. 
Great. Thank you. Um, one of the things somebody told me about YA is um, once you get to 16, it changes, and I guess this makes sense, right? It sort of changes your your exposure to the world uh, because a lot of 16 year olds can drive or have friends who drive and those kinds of things. Um, and so it changes what they have access to and what they can do. So um, I think for what you're talking about, 14, 15 is probably good because otherwise you know, she just get in the car and drive away, right? Yeah. And so yeah. at some point, yeah, right. there has to be some way to limit that. I was thinking of when you were talking about, you know, your what happened slide. Mm -hmm. And I thought probably a really good example of that is um, old Agatha Christie. Once again, she did it all. Uh, Murder on the Orient Express. Mm -hmm. where you have this incredible backstory. And and uh, and of course, who killed Poirot. But, you know, the what happened is is enormous. Right. And then, you know, and then why, 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 why? So. Right. Um, I thought that was a really good example of something of that back engineering into into a plot in a way. Yeah. And, and I think um, I've always thought that that would that in itself, the story of what happened would have made a great book on its own. Yes. I mean, leaving aside an act as an actual mystery, but just as yeah. just a drama. Um, yeah. It just to me, I always thought that would have been a great book on its own. Yeah, I agree. I agree. All right. Um, so I promised you that you'd be able to take some of this and and then go do something with it when you're done. Um, so what now? So if you're a plotter um, like me, um, you can take this and then start to build your outline, right? And obviously you'll be adding some more characters, you'll add locations, um, and then you'll need to start to sprinkle some clues. And that's a part of, for me, where putting you know, what happened together helps because then I can start to sprinkle through where do they find out about these different things and how do they find out about them? And are they in ways where they can actually see, oh, this is a clue or is it just something that's sort of sitting there um, that they don't really notice until much, much later in the story? Um, for me, I kind of break down um, my outlines into three quarters. So the first is um, what people tend to think of as act one. Um, and so that's really kind of introducing everything, the sleuth, the mystery, the locations, and the cast of characters. Um, and at this point, a lot of them are just characters. They're not really suspects. They're just people who are around. Um, Q2 is, for me, is really sort of that first half of Act 2. Um, and so this is where the sleuth really investigates, right? And then some of your characters turn into suspects based on the interactions and all of that. Um, and then, as I was saying before, towards the end of that Q2 section is where the sleuth really starts to hone in on a suspect. Um, it's the wrong suspect, um, but they really start to hone in on that suspect. Um, and at the end of Q2, discover they're totally wrong. And that could be, um, you know, in, we'll go back to Agatha Christie, right? So in a number of Agatha Christie stories, right around the midpoint, the primary suspect dies. Um, or, or they come up with some iron tight alibi, and so it couldn't possibly have been them, in which case now the sleuth, as we go into Q3, has to regroup and figure out, okay, well, where am I now? And this is generally where the, the thief or the killer has the upper hand, right? And so now the sleuth goes from investigating to sort of being on the run and, and trying to stay one step ahead, um, though really they're one step behind. Um, the culprit. Then Q4 corresponds really to Act 3. And so this is where the sleuth has everything they're going to get in terms of information. And so now it's time to, to solve the mystery, to narrow down the suspects, figure out who, who really done it, um, and then the big reveal at the end. Um, and so that's kind of how I break it down from um, an outlining perspective. And then what I try to do is I try to make sure that I sprinkle clues in all of these quarters. Um, and so there may be things where um, your sleuth might notice something on page three um, that is a key to the mystery, but there's no mystery yet. And so there's no need for them to catalog it as such. Um, and so it's not until much later in the story as they're thinking back everything that's happened that they realize they've had one of the key pieces of information all along. So if you're a pantser, um, I don't really know how this works. <laughs> well, I'll just tell you, get to writing. 
But, um, you know, as you're writing and as you're adding characters, um, what I try to do for every character is I consider what secret, you know, this character has, right? What are they trying to hide from everybody else? Whether they're a suspect or not, um, everybody has a secret of some sort. Um, and like I said, that impacts how they behave um, and how they interact with others. And so think about as you're adding in characters and coming up with new situations, what those secrets are. Um, and then my other recommendation is, um, because I know pantsers tend to do a lot of free writing and things like that, is think about writing a few so uh, scenes with characters um, and, you know, mainly suspects, I think this works well with, that don't include your sleuth. So what are, the, what are the conversations that happen or the interactions, even if they don't talk to one another between two suspects after the sleuth has left the room um, or when they know the sleuth is on their way? Um, and so give that some thought and, and maybe write out a few scenes. Um, and again, like the what happened exercise, it gives you things that are going on so that the world continues um, even when your sleuth is not around. Um, and so your, your sleuth may leave a room and come back and the coffee cups are, are in different places. Um, I actually read this in, I'm trying to remember now what book it was, um, but basically everybody had moved around because they were all pretending to be happy and joyful and, and one couple was pretending to be in love. And as soon as the sleuth walked out of the room, they all kind of went to where they would normally be. Um, and so everybody moved around. Later the sleuth returned, the room was empty, but all the coffee cups had been moved around. Um, and that was something then later on in the story, they figured out, well, wait, these people aren't really being honest about how they interact with one another. Um, so final thoughts, um, as I always say, remember, let your sleuth solve the mystery um, and find ways to keep adults out of the way um, and then create a story world that can include everyone. Um, and most of all, um, I say this because <laughs> I, uh, I have a lot of fun writing. Um, I put a lot of weird, quirky, um, references that only me and maybe my brother might get, uh, but it makes me smile while I'm doing it. And so have fun while you're writing and enjoy it. Um, and that's all for today. Um, thanks so much. Um, we made it through. I think we're maybe a couple minutes over, but appreciate you sticking in and, and hanging out. Um, and if people have questions or, or want to chat about things, we can certainly do that as well. Um, and Brian, I was going to, oh, sorry. I'm going to stop sharing. Where am I? No, I know. I know. There we are. Okay. Um, there we are. Uh, I thought that, you know, going through this, um, this would be a fantastic blueprint. I mean, for any mystery, because you bring up, you know, some great points. But I thought this would be a really great blueprint for um, uh, cozies, because mm -hmm. you're dealing with some of the same issues. You know, you don't want a lot of violence. You, you know, you want it, if it happens, it's off the screen. You know, obviously you're going to have bodies, but they're going to be off screen. You, you know, you have, especially with the amateur sleuth, you've got someone who is, you know, where the authority figures are often a hindrance mm -hmm. in solving the crime. I mean, it, it really is a, a, clo a cozy blueprint as well. I, yeah. I thought that, I mean, that's what I came up with. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. I think middle grade mysteries in particular are, um, they're really cozies, right? What's different in a lot of sp spaces is the age of the sleuth. Right. Um, and so obviously, you know, the age of the sleuth then determines how far they can get in, a, in an average day and different things like that. But yeah, they, it really is the same sort of model as, as writing a cozy. Because, and because you, your protagonist has that kind of innocence, you mm -hmm. know, that, that I would say, you know, certainly middle age you know, middle grade kids have, and that this is not, this is a, maybe a new world and a world that kind of takes them outside of uh, their prescribed boundaries and right. they, and they find they like it, at least, you know, with the amateur sleuth and obviously, mm -hmm. you know, in, in series in middle grade mysteries, the same thing where, where the boundaries start fading away and they, I hate this word, but they love their agency. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and then the same thing happens in the amateur, I know it's really overdone, but fits that there is a similar uh a similar thing happens in the amateur sleuth world where there's a confidence there's that that is gained from solving these crimes and and again the authority figures are a hindrance rather than a help right very very similar yeah um i would say that so the one challenge um that i think middle grade writers have that you don't have as much in the cozy space is um, you do have to be somewhat careful with how much of a hindrance the authority figures are. Right. 
right. uh, because in a lot of cases, the authority figures are the ones who buy your books. Um, right. Right, 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 you know, right. or or librarians or teachers, those kinds of things, and so um, there's that bit of balance. But you're right; I, I think it's much the same thing. It's just sort of how you do it um, in a way where you don't tick off the people who pay your bills. Or, or like um, in the Harry Potter series, where you have one adult, um, Dumbledore, who mm -hmm. is who is being, who is who is the good authority figure, but who right. is being by all the bad authority figures right you know the minister of magic and lucius malfoy and, and all those people where where you do have one person that the kids trust but that that yeah. person becomes neutered um you know cannot act for them or or you know is is pushed out to some extent yeah yeah that's a good point um and i think that's a way that a lot of writers do that um i just read kidnap on the california comet um mm. And that's, you know, that's one of the things that happens there is you have a lot of adults um, who, man, talk about being a hindrance. Um, but the uncle is, is this loving, caring, protecting person. And so it sort of balances out all of the, the sort of, frankly, horrible adults um, that they're dealing with. And, and so I think that's one good way of doing it is, look, all adults aren't bad. Here are some adults who are really doing the right things. We're just saying these particular adults in this particular book have issues, but that's right. not a commentary on all adults everywhere. Right, yeah. right, right, yeah. yeah. So it's a good way to balance that. Um, does anyone else have any questions? You can unmute and because I, I just thought this was great. I'm gonna belly who this um, on uh, both our MWA discussion board and um, because I just think it it was excellent blueprint. Thank you. And uh, makes me realize that maybe I should be less of a pantser and more of a plotter. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, you know, it, it's uh, I mean, I'm not a total pantser, but uh, just that that I mean, you're doing a, I think a lot of, especially back engineering into the into the plot with the what happened and why. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, you know, you're setting up your backstory, which gives you a real. Um, subconscious blueprint for what your characters are going to do right. and how they're going to react uh right. and i i just thought that was great i've never seen it um so you see kg thomas says i'm learning how to get the plotting into the development stage oh, cool i don't know what that means can you uh elaborate on that uh kg thomas no oh uh sorry so oh, yeah yeah i'm a i'm a i'm a big cancer so, um, but I do sci-fi. So a lot of it is world building. And so I have to like allow that space to, um, to develop the world and find out what that's all about. And now I'm going back and figuring out what, so what is all this? So right. I do have to reverse engineer the, the plot now. And, but I'm learning how to do that kind of as I'm doing it, instead of like doing it after the fact, this has been a big learning curve for me, mm -hmm. it, getting the plotting at the same time as the development of the of the world and the, and the discovery because i don't like interfering with discovery by by having it too planned yeah 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 no i hear i hear what you're yeah. saying um so i write sci-fi um also oh awesome and and yeah i i hear what you're saying it so it's weird so writing sci-fi is harder for me because i do still plan um, but I, and even when I, when I plan this, in fact, like if you, if you read the, what happened sheet, that's actually the first one I did. I ended up doing a second one because it changed as I started going through the plotting process. Um, but like when I write sci-fi, it is that sort of, how does this stuff work and, and all of that. And then you realize like two thirds of the way through the story, you decide how something works. It's like, well, wait, but they've been doing this all along. So now I got to go back and fix how they do this. Yes. Um, and so it's a it's a bit of a challenge for me, um, but I enjoy world building. And I will say that even for mysteries, um, I, world building is important. Um, and so I have done, I didn't share it today, but I've done a whole exercise with what um, Mr. Andrew's house looks like and all of that, um, because Chandler is, um, he's a really over the top kind of person. He has a whole room that's nothing but um, antique cannons. And wow. so you can go through his canon wow. collection. Yeah. Um, and so I do like the, I, and I, it, so this is the part of writing that I like the most. Um, I like the planning part of it. And I think that's why I, I do it and I kind of gravitate towards it and why discovery as I write can be so challenging for me because 
I do end up feeling like, oh, wait, now I need to go back and fix all this stuff. And then it's figuring out when you go back and fix it. Like, do I do it now or do I get to the end and go back and fix it everywhere and all of that? So, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> we can have a support group on that. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And yeah, we could have a whole workshop on just having to go back and revise based on something we've discovered at the end of the book. Yes. Yeah. I agree. But, but don't you feel that also that the, um, uh, you know, in fantasy based uh, books uh, where, you know, I've read books where I thought, you know, it, they s- s- uh, were, were not, they didn't develop the character and the plot arcs enough, but the world building was fantastic. Mm-hmm. And I've read reviews of the of by these books, thinking, "Wow, this book got great reviews." Why? And it was because the readers who loved it were really they loved the world building, and they were yeah. able to forgive the author for what I consider sort of skinny uh, plot and character arcs. <laughs> but yeah. you know, but as far as the reader was concerned, that you know, that the people who sort of gravitate towards that fantasy type of writing, uh, just they that's what they wanted. And so, you know, maybe I was off base because, you know, I was looking for more uh, character and plot arcs. But, you know, it's a, so I think, in, you know, the world building issue, I think, is very audience specific. Yeah. I mean, that's what it appears to me to be. Yeah, no, I think you're right, Claire. I, um, it, there are a lot of um, books now that are devoted to just world building. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm amazed at like the number of fantasy writing seminars and things like that that are just about world building um there you know at some point there will be a story in this world but let's build a world um (laughs) and and i think a lot of it is because everybody or just about everybody has some sort of fantasy world in their head um and most of the time they've had it since they were kids and so it's kind of getting it out on paper and all of that and then seeing other people's worlds and you really focus on well what's the world like and, and so the story sort of takes a backseat to that. Um, as much as I love Star Wars, that's the thing with Star Wars, right? Is Star Wars was phenomenal because of the galaxy that was built. And, and there was a decent story for most of the book or most of the movies um, that existed in that world. Um, but that's why they can still continue to make TV shows and all of these things based yeah. on all of these people and everybody watches them because that galaxy is so entrenched and so ingrained in everyone's minds. Yeah. Well, and I think the the earlier, certainly the earlier movies had much more of an impact, um, yeah. you know, because we, it was also new and right. it was also innovative. Yeah. And, and now we know, you know, we know what to expect from the CGI and I, and mm-hmm. which I think ironically uh, makes the, the glaring character and plot arcs that you know don't quite work yep. um don't quite work because yeah. we're no longer you know we, you're, you're no longer wowed right, right. because you've sort of yeah. seen this yeah so, um, yeah and i think in some respects that's what's pushed a lot of the world building even further right is because people have realized hey the world's got to be really spectacular or yeah. you know you're going to be in trouble so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Cool. Does anybody have anything else they want to say? I, this has been a great, great, great presentation, Brian. Um, like Thank I you. said, I'm going to ballyhoo it on on uh, to our members because uh, it's I I don't know how many people are watching Facebook Live, but. Uh, this has just been great. And uh, thank, thank you. you so much. And yeah, and I just wanted to echo that and say, and thank you. I uh, just wanted to say middle grade was really my favorite age to read. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've always wanted to write something in it, but never really seemed to be able to get a toehold. So I, I thought that this was really great and in, in like sort of pointing me how to get possibly get started on something like that. And I really appreciate that. So thanks oh, a lot. My pleasure. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, really, really great. So I'm going to end live on Facebook, if I can do that. Stop.